Stop worrying about these five things in audio. That's what we're going to be talking about in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasala with Audioholics. I wanted to do just a quick informal video on these five things that some audiophiles worry about. I see it popping up quite often, whether it's in the forums or the YouTube comments or emails, you name it. I've covered each one of these topics in detail in separate videos, and I'll try to put some of that in the cards so you could take a look at those if you want, or you could just search our channel if you want to dive deeper into these topics. So I also want to get your comments and see what you guys think about this as well. So the number one thing I think audiophiles worry about too much is the impedance selector switch on AV receivers. I've done countless videos, countless bench tests over a 25 year period of audioholics showing you that when you set that impedance switch to the low setting, you lose power. You don't want to do that. The whole purpose of that low impedance setting on the AVRs of today is so when they take those receivers to UL, they want to get a four ohm safe sticker or certification for it. And the way that they get around the fact that they don't have massive heat sinks to dissipate power and keep the temperature low is they derate the amplifier when they're testing it. So by putting that switch to the low setting, it usually steps the voltage down on the transformer and you lose power. And in most cases, when you go to four ohms, um, you're getting maybe half the power that what that receiver would normally do. That receiver will work fine in the eight ohm or more setting. You just make sure that your receiver has good ventilation. But the thing that just kills me is when people will look at the data and they'll still switch it to four ohms and thinking they're going to impedance match with their speakers. It doesn't work that way. You're literally just stepping the power down. You're making that amplifier clip sooner. You're losing power. You're losing dynamics. You're losing performance leave the receiver impedance selector switch in the default setting. Don't mess with it. Listen to me now, believe me later, look at the videos that I did on this topic. Don't mess with that impedance selector switch. So number two, cables and audio tweaks. A guy, again, guys, I've been doing this for 25 years and I've been preaching to the choir about cables and I've been showing you the measurements, showing you the science. Most of the esoteric cables and the claims are complete nonsense. I've done countless videos on that. And you could sink tens of thousands of dollars into these cables with the promise that it's going to be, it's going to give you chocolatey mid range or better performance or better sound. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's totally bogus. I've shown just taking 10 gauge zip cord speaker cable that you could get at Home Depot, pure copper cable. And I put it up against $5,000 AudioQuest cables with batteries on the end of them. And when I measured them, the AudioQuest did not measure any better than the 10 gauge. And in fact, it had more inductance and it, that little battery pack acted like an RF antenna. It was picking up noise. And then when I go to measure with an amplifier with the cables to an actual loudspeaker, whether I'm using 10 gauge or I'm using my fancy Kimber cables or I'm using the AudioQuest cables, it made less than a 0.1 tenth of a dB difference at 20 kilohertz driving a four ohm speaker. So you're talking about less than fractions of a decimal point, which are indiscernible by your ears. Just moving your head a couple of inches makes much bigger impact or using actual EQ. And that's the problem with a lot of these esoteric cable companies is they want to sell you an EQ when in most cases their little EQ cables don't do much at all, or it actually does make things worse, like the ones with the big boxes on them. If you want to equalize your system, you do it with digital EQ. You do it in the digital domain, preferably. That's the best way you're going to improve the sonics of your, of your system. Not with an a, not with a um, esoteric cable, not with some weird audio tweak where you got to hang things, little dots on your walls or put, you know, fancy devices, hum dehumidifiers in a room. All that stuff is nonsense. <laughs> okay. You could do much better working with your speaker positioning, your calibration, your room acoustics, your EQ. These are things that really make a difference, but I know there's a little more work involved with some of these, but if you put the work into it, you're going to it's going to pay you dividends in the sound quality that you're going to get in return. 
rather than messing with these expensive and geeky audio tweaks that really do next to nothing and usually nothing. So number three, YouTube listening demos. I see this all the time. And anytime we do a loudspeaker review or an amplifier review on YouTube, we get comments down below saying, why don't you just let us listen to the speaker or let us listen to the amplifier? And that just, that irks me so bad because there's just so much of a breakdown and understanding of psychoacoustics and how a loudspeaker plays in a room and how you can't translate that over YouTube with a pair of headphones or in-ear monitors. No matter how hard YouTubers are trying to make this case with binaural recordings, it's still completely bogus. You're not getting an accurate representation of that loudspeaker through YouTube on your earbuds or whatever you're listening to. In fact, one of the top companies in the industry tried to science this out, Crutchfield. They put a lot of money into measuring speakers anechoically, measuring the headphones as well, doing transfer functions, doing binaural recordings of each of the speakers. We're talking about teams of PhDs that worked on this probably a couple of years and put a big amount of money into it. And we did a video on it. And when you go and you compare some of their home speakers, whether they're $12,000 Rebels to a pair of $200 JBLs, they sound virtually identical through the headphones. And I've heard these speakers in real life, and I know they're not even close in sound quality and output and in, in bandwidth and bass and dynamics. None of that goes through when you do these YouTube listening tests or just any online test. You just can't do that. Nothing replaces the fact that you need a real demo experience, whether you go to a local retailer that has speakers on display that you can compare or you get them in your home, which is the best way to do it, especially since a lot of companies offer 30 to 60 day trials. You got to listen with your ears. You can't be doing this on YouTube with a pair of in-ear monitors or a pair of Bose noise canceling headphones. So again, I reiterate, we do not do YouTube listening tests for that very reason. Number four, purchase validation from other audio files. I see this often when someone uh, goes and drops, you know, five grand on an amplifier or a pair of speakers. You'll get people in the comments saying that you could have got this product. It would have been better for half the price or you overpaid for that. You overpaid for that or, you know, whatever. They just come up with some type of negativity and it brings people down after they purchase something because they want that validation. And I'm here to tell you that you don't need the validation and you don't even need the validation from us. If you like a speaker or you like an amplifier and it didn't bench well, or we didn't care for it in particular, or people online preferred a different brand, that's fine for them. Not every product is for you. That's why there's such a diverse um, playing field when it comes to brands, product categories, you name it. It's like 400 different speaker brands to choose from. So not everybody's going to agree on what great sound is. So again, I would not worry too much about what other people think. Look at the data. Look at what people are saying, if you like, when you're trying to pre, you're trying to narrow down your list, right? You're trying to narrow down your list of speaker brands or your, or your amplifier brands. See what people are saying, obviously, but don't worry about getting validation from someone after you purchase something and you're already happy with it, including cables. Look, if you want to spend the money on fancy audio jewelry, be my guest. All I'm trying to tell you is try to pick something that doesn't do harm to the signal. Try to at least get something as good as $2 foot 10 gauge zip cord from Home Depot or some Mogami cables or Belden cables from Blue Jeans. These are benchmark level stuff and not very expensive to give you all the fidelity from your system. Anything beyond that just becomes cosmetic and it's just, you know, something to make you feel good and chocolatey about the experience. And sometimes, look, Sometimes when you dress up your system, you perceive it as sounding better because psychologically you see it and it looks nicer. You know, a clean space looks nicer, something fancy, a nice looking finish on a speaker cabinet can really enhance your visual cues to what you're when you're listening to music or watching movies or whatever. So number five, waiting for the new model before buying. That's one that I'm guilty of sometimes as well, because look, when I go to buy a new car, I'm wondering, will BMW or will Audi or Porsche, will they increase the horsepower in the next model year refresh? And it kills me if I go buy something and then six months later, they release a new model and it does that. But with like 
AVRs and amplifiers, the technology is kind of already mature and you're usually not going to get leaps better in performance on the next model year of an AVR, for example. Denon might have a new feature, but the power plant should be the same. But the bottom line is if you need something now, do you really want to wait eight months for a new feature that you may not even use on a TV or an AVR or something? I would suggest get what you need when you need it. Get Make sure it has the features that you need. Make sure it has the performance level that you're expecting. And don't second guess it and don't regret it after you purchase and the next model comes in and replaces it. That's just the cycle of life, right? So these are the five things I wanted to get off my chest with you guys. Let me know which one you might be hung up on or which one you think really is, is the worst out of these five. I'd love to hear your comments down below. Don't forget about all the different affiliates that we have with Dream Media and Audio Advice. We have links down below. If you do make any purchases, we appreciate the support to run Audioholics, of course. And guys, give me some comments. Hit the thumb up. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.